It's Alive 1969, not to be confused with the much better It's Alive 1974 from that other Larry director, is the eighth and final film made under the Azalea Pictures production company distributed by American International for television syndication. To discuss this movie is to discuss the singular work of Larry Buchanan, a self-professed schlockmeister in the grand tradition of directors such as Ed Wood. I'm a Buchanan neophyte myself, this being his first film I've seen, so suffice it to say that he has something of a cult following, with some of his films having been released under the wonderful boutique imprint Something Weird. He has an autobiography that was published, as well as a critical examination of his body of work, and a $150 million Disney film that took a cue from his $20,000 Mars Needs Women for its title. Buchanan grew up an orphan in Texas, where he developed his love of cinema at a young age. In 1952, he made his first independently produced feature, Grub Steak, and shockingly enough, Stanley Kubrick offered to lens it for him. Of course, Buchanan couldn't afford him, so he declined. The different direction his career could have gone. His directorial career began in earnest with 1961's The Naked Witch, and after a spate of sexually and racially charged exploitation films, was offered the deal from AIP to produce the straight-to-television films It's Alive constitutes the last of. The film begins with an interminable drive-up that recalls films like Birdemic Shock and Terror, The Brown Bunny, and Touch of Satan. Yes, this predates all of those, but you get the idea. It's boring to watch. This sequence sets the tone for the stylistic trappings that will hobble the picture throughout. Much like The Creeping Terror, another syndicated made-for-TV movie from those other purveyors of cinematic classics, Crown International, it seems sync sound was lost or not recorded for much of the film, with sporadic voiceover clumsily offering narrative clarification for the viewer. For Leslin Stearns and her husband Norman, it was another day in a cross-country tour. We learn a New York City couple are on vacation in the Ozarks of Arkansas, driving on country roads away from the highway in an effort to experience the local color. They come across a paleontologist by the name of Wayne Thomas, who proves himself to be generous and forgiving, in contrast to the asshole husband Norman Stearns, who to my eye resembles Tom Kenny. Desperate for a fill-up, Norman and his wife Leela make their way to a roadside attraction and speak to the proprietor, Mr. Greeley, who offers them respite in his home while they wait for the dubious gas man to pass through. While the couple is meeting the housemaid Bella, Greeley busies himself with kidnapping Thomas, who has recently wandered in, unbeknownst to the rest. Afterwards, they are given the grand tour of the depressing animal prison, with a final stop at the not-at-all suspect Onyx Cave. It's here that Greeley reveals himself to be a madman, driven wild with the rage from the loss of business due to the recent highway construction. He locks them behind prison bars in the cave with Thomas, and leaves them there for Come dead. Back. I'll, I'll give you whatever you want! He's not so cruel as to refuse to feed them, at least, and sends Bella to provide their meals. Now go into the kitchen and get some food for those folks. Oh, no. Now! While meeting with the prisoners, she reveals The Thing, the name of which must have been influenced by Howard Hawke's 1951 film The Thing from Another World, which is a laughably unconvincing rubber suit recycled from previous Buchanan production Creature of Destruction. Greeley returns to the cave and does his evil villain thing, then shoots Thomas, only stunning him slightly despite being a body mass hit. The monster attacks and eats the character we've been dying to see devoured, Norman. After Leela and Wayne regroup, he postulates that the hot springs the creature emerged from must have kept it in a state of suspended animation and that it is in fact an extinct Mosasaurus. Greeley returns again to explain that he discovered the creature while searching for gold in the cave and began feeding it, but its hunger was never sated, so it ate a customer while in the cave. This led him to continue feeding it as a form of punishment for society's mistreating him. Look, why don't you exhibit it? You exhibit the rest of your creatures, why don't you uh, exhibit this too? Yes. All you need is publicity, advertising. I'll pay for it. Why, why people will come from all over the world to see the uh, thing. 
Well, you'll be famous. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. You still don't believe. You're making fun of me, aren't you? At this point, Bella reveals to the couple, and yes, calling them a couple despite Leela's husband having just been eaten is appropriate, as she wastes no time making her amorous intentions clear to Thomas, that she was also kidnapped by Greeley once upon a time. This is where the film takes a seriously baffling left turn. For the next 20 plus minutes, more than one quarter of the film's running time, we are presented with a first-person account of her kidnapping and psychological torture in the form of a flashback. This excruciating sequence destroys the pace of the film, and by the time it's over, the audience will possibly have forgotten what the main conflict of the film is in the first place, and certainly no longer care how it concludes. So thorough is the punishment of it that any possible goodwill this already quite bad film may have extended is utterly forgotten banish from memory as a dream upon waking. So if you make it this far in the film, congratulations, I guess? And believe it or not, the plot does pick back up where it left off in the cave. The three concoct a scheme to use Thomas's explosives to blow the bars of the prison off and escape. But the whole thing makes one want to shout at the screen as it's revealed that there is an access tunnel that leads from the cave cell to the house, and that has been utilized by Bella and Greeley the whole time. A scene earlier on attempts to hand wave this apparent plot hole by showing the characters having trouble accessing it. It's a hit on the head, but everything's a little nuts. Hey, there's a tunnel down here. It goes almost straight down. We could go down and look. Why? So we can fall and break our necks? Wait, someone's coming. The thing is, though, if Bella, who doesn't appear to be a gymnast or anything, can do it, Shouldn't these relatively younger and fitter people be able to do it as well? Anyway, who cares, because the film is unceasingly stupid, so if you've made it to the climax, by now you've accepted your fate. And that's the ultimate problem with this incompetent and haphazard film. It takes a decent Texas Chainsaw Massacre meets Creature from the Black Lagoon premise with a dash of social commentary and flops around like a dying fish on a pier for an hour and 20 minutes. It's a fairly slight running time, but... With that nearly 30-minute detour into the life and hard times of Bella, it takes an already slow film and grinds it to a halt. Given just a modicum of directorial competence and narrative coherence, it may have been an entertaining B-movie. But therein lies the appeal of Larry Buchanan. If you can suffer through his IMDb bottom 100 worthy filmic output, and maybe if he'd had an episode of MST3K devoted to one of his films, maybe he would be in the bottom 100. The Stockholm Syndrome might kick in, and you'll find yourself falling for its campy charm. Or maybe you have some sense and stay away forever. Neither way. Mm -hmm.